Here we are, okay. Now, here's a question from uh, the beginning of the Bible. Uh, right, we have the beginning, the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, right, which describes God's creation of the world. And what's, what's neat about that and kind of unique is that we get a few chapters in the beginning about how the world was in that pristine time before sin entered the world. And they, the first few chapters there recall the most salient moments for us to understand about our world uh, and ourselves. Back when it was all good, back when God was calling everything good <laughs> that was happening in the world, right? It, and we kind of wish it said more. Like I read that sometimes, that part of the Bible, and say, gosh, I wish it told us a little bit more about the sinless state. Like where to, where to squeeze the toothpaste tube? Uh, at the back or the middle, like which is, which is the sinless way to do that? That would, that would have helped our marriage um, if we could have understood that. Or, you know, which really is the best tractor? Is it uh, really uh, John Deere or any other kind, you know? <laughs> or, you know, what's the best form of government? All sorts of things we'd love to know. <laughs> that would be great to know. It doesn't tell us that. But it does tell us some, some important things, the important things we need to know. Interestingly, a lot of it's about the creation of gender uh, in our world. Well, then it tells us about the fall of humanity and the entrance of sin into the world. So here's our question this morning. Here's your Bible question. What is the last thing that we are told about that world, that perfect world before there was sin that entered into the world. What's the last thing the Bible tells us before the story about the, the serpent and the garden, the entrance into sin? I think we have a hand already. What's the last? It was good. It was good. That is a great line, but that was not the last line. <laughs> good try, good try. Oh, we have a question, we have a hand over here from the youth section. Told about the tree in the middle of the garden. No, that is not the last thing before the account. Last thing we might read about. Yes. They were naked and unashamed. Could we have a hand for the winner? That is the right answer. The last thing we're told before the account of what happened. Uh, before the account of, of sin entering into the world was that they were naked and they were unashamed. Important point, especially for the topic we're going to be addressing this morning. Uh, and what I want to do this morning, you know, when we talk about transgenderism, which is what we're going to get into, there's a lot that we could talk about. Uh, and what I want to try to do in our limited time this morning is to give you the the big pieces uh, in order to understand um, what's going on so that you have a sense and, and feel confident that you can, you can understand what's going on. And then I'm going to go for about uh, uh, 40 minutes and then hopefully we'll have some time afterward for questions if you say, well, what about this situation that I'm facing? All right, so let's start here. You're at the kitchen table And uh, your young'un sits, uh, sits across from you and is telling you, I'm queer non-binary. <laughs> or maybe you're in a situation where your teen has a friend and your teen's friend is telling them, I'm really trans. And you're sitting there and, and your teen is asking you, how do I respond to this? What does this mean? And you're sitting there bewildered you say, I don't know how to interpret this. Or maybe you have a relative in your, fra in your family who has asked you to use a different name for him now and use different pronouns for him. Uh, and you are uh, wondering how your family should respond to this. What's actually being said? Transgenderism is a, is a big umbrella of a term, it turns out now, that it, it can mean many different conditions, many different experiences. And so if you're talking to somebody who is uh, standing under that umbrella, 
you kind of you kind of need a flow chart to to get at the heart of what's really going on what's really being said and so what i want to do for us is is kind of give you a flow chart of just big categories of what that statement could mean when somebody says that to you so you need to understand what's really going on. And, and you can do it, you know, these, this is not a, uh, something that you're like, wow, I need an expert to understand. I think you can understand based on what the Bible tells us about ourselves. So the first thing we're gonna do is your first response. If you get um, something like that, if somebody is telling you, somebody in your life, somebody that you love says something like that to you, what's, what's the first thing we need, to, we need to do. And your first response is, is critical when you have such a statement in front of you. And it's very important before we understand what's going on is to sound the note of acceptance and love. These are the kinds of things if you're a parent and you have a teen that's saying something like this to you, this is the time when you say things like, I will always love you and I want to walk with you through this. I'm so glad that you talked to me about this. And, and I just want to emphasize that this is important as a first response, because when we're affirming our love for somebody who, who might be saying, I'm trans or I'm queer non-binary uh, in front of us, it's, it's not an agreement with their interpretation of things. You're not agreeing with their interpretation of things, but what you're doing is you're prioritizing the relationship. And that's what you want to be doing. That's what God wants us to be doing. Once the first let people know that the relationship is important to us. And then you do need to figure out what's going on beneath those words. And so what I want to do is give you five boxes, five possible categories that you're dealing with here that you can just keep in your mind as you talk to your teen or your loved one uh, to, to listen and try to decide how to help, okay? And the first box is the need or craving of a young person to fit in. You know, and in that time of life, um, there's this almost visceral response we have to be accepted in our, among our peers. It's just really important to us. And these days, you know, if it's become fashionable uh, to be trans in your neighborhood, then uh, a, a teen might just not want to miss out. So a lot of times what's behind what's going on is just really a craving to fit in to the latest fashion. Uh, it's what's behind this uh, term that they use. I don't, it's kind of a silly term, but it's rapid onset gender dysphoria which is not really gender dysphoria at all, but what it is, is what uh, parents know, is always happening among teens. You know, that if, it's, if there's a, something that's become fashionable, um, your teen wants to fit in, you know? And so, if this is your situation, that somebody is just wanting to fit in uh, with their peer group, then the solution is the same as it's always been from time immemorial. That is to understand that in the teen years, it's a battle for our child's heart. And the book of Proverbs kind of brings this out because it's written uh, to youth. And uh, in, throughout the book, you have the, the father and the, or the father and the mother pleading uh, with the youth, go with my counsel rather than the counsel of his peers. Go with what I'm telling you. And so you want to make sure that you're doing what you can to win your child's heart. Detoxing from social media helps a lot. Uh, and it, what you should do is take this as a call to renew your bond with them. Because when you have a situation like this where a teen is confused about their gender, okay, the biggest factor in determining what's going to happen in the next few years is the quality of the relationship between that teen and his parent. It's the quality of your relationship with them that in the teen years that makes the biggest difference uh, in what's going to happen next. So that's just something that 
Uh, if you're confronted with a situation, you should keep in mind that that's driving some of what's going on. The second box, if somebody, uh, if a young person, say, ha or any person has a kind of sense that they're in the wrong body, a second thing that could be going on is what I would call a lurking comorbidity or co-condition. Uh, what you don't hear a lot about uh, in the media is that gender dysphoria often goes along with other conditions. It's often, there are other things that are going on that um, often go along right along with gender dysphoria. Autism is uh, linked with, with gender dysphoria. And people who work in gender clinics are well aware of this, that, you know, there's very often the case that someone also has autism. And that's a, really the problem uh, that's kind of gender dysphoria is masking the real problem. 25% uh, of uh, schizophrenic uh, folks also have cross-gender desires. Uh, it could be an anxiety disorder or personality disorder. And very often these things go together. And there, in the, in the, there have been studies that link these. Um, but uh, in the, in the professional uh, counseling world, these are not paid attention to too much by, by a lot of people. And so it's, uh, it's a shame uh, that people are not getting the help that they need. So if you've got this situation, if you're in this box with someone, then uh, you, know, you need to address this usually um, on multiple fronts, probably therapy, counseling of some sort, possibly medication. Def definitely spirituality, addressing what's going on with the powerful truths of the Gospels. And the New Testament would encourage us not to dismiss demonic uh, activity as well. So that's the second box. Uh, the third box would be a true body alienation. And I'm going to talk more about that this morning with you, that someone really does have an alienation from their body or they've they feel like they're in the wrong body. And if that's the case, if somebody really is experiencing intense body distress, then it's most likely due to an earlier trauma in life. Um, I am a big fan of Walt Heyer, is a guy who uh, is what we call a detransitioner, that he actually went through a transition in imitation of the opposite, opposite sex. And then he realized this was a mistake uh, as a Christian and he uh, went back in the other way. And he spends all of his time now helping people who are in this situation. And uh, he always attributes it to, he's always asking questions about things, when did you start first feeling this way? And he finds a very fruitful conversation because a lot of times these traumas get buried and they're hidden. And uh, the answer here is to be able to revisit that with the help of the Holy Spirit to reinterpret what happened, what's happened there and, and to understand Christ's healing that he can bring there to put a person on a different path. So a couple other boxes. Um, sometimes, you know, you get a young person who says, I'm LGBT, you know, and they're not really any of those things, but they have a real sense of uh, justice and they perceive there's, there's bullying going on for people who are in a minority. And they're really upset about that and they want, they want there to be justice to be done. And so if that's going on, you know, um, it's good to be uh, realizing that. And what I'm going to do is try to give some things and, and what I do in this book that, that's coming out to help you to um, assist that person in understanding how to really help people, how to understand uh, ways that uh, you can help people that uh, don't involve hormones or knives uh, in, in what they're doing. Okay, and there's one more box I gotta put on here. If, if you have a teen who's feeling confused about their gender, this probably isn't their box, but it's, it's actually a big part of transgenderism. And that is cross-dressing uh, for sexual arousal. 
cross-dressing. Um, and and this, is, this is actually a big group of people. It's the main reason why people will cross-dress is because this is a way in which um, they do get aroused. And this isn't talked about in the media, but uh, this is what's uh, a big category of what's going on as well. Um, so, kind of a lot of di- a, l- a number of different possibilities here of what's going on. Somebody says I'm trans. Um, just something to realize and have in your head as you're talking about this. And all of these really um, need uh, need us to to understand uh, some principles from the Bible t- for us for us to be able to help. We need to know that there are answers and that there, there are solutions um, that don't involve uh, cutting or chemicals. So what I want to do is focus in on one of those boxes that gets the most attention, and that is um, gender dysphoria. How are we to understand gender dysphoria as Christians? And The first step, really, in understanding this is to understand how the Bible says that we are, what the Bible says that we are, to understand um, ourselves biblically. And what's popular these days is to say that who you really are, your identity, who you are as a person, is, is what's inside of you, okay? Uh, I have a picture here. It's an etching after a, a drawing done by William Blake, and it's the moment of death. And what you have here is the soul uh, kind of leaving the body. And it's a kind of it's a kind of great uh, kind of portrait for our times, great meme for our times, because the focus is on the soul, right? This is the soul leaving leaving the body, and uh, our eyes are drawn to that soul, it's, it's literally the center of the picture. And that's the way people feel. It's like, this is who you really are. And the body is some kind of accessory. You know, it's some kind of uh, iPhone skin that you could uh, put on or take off. But who you really are is what's inside. And so you have this expression, we're embodied souls. And the soul is maybe a prison, uh, as uh, the Greeks would say, that we need to escape from. Um, it's holding us back. But that's not the Christian view. The Christian view is not that the body is something uh, extra that uh, is, is kind of imprisoning our bodies. Um, it's more like we're ensouled bodies. <laughs> In the Christian view, our bodies are very much part of who we are. It was it was the human body that God formed in order to breathe the breath of life into at the beginning. And so this is another piece of art. This is a uh, grave uh, sculpture that's uh, in a cemetery at Menton, which is in, the, is in the French Alps. It's kind of an allegory of the resurrection, another important time. It's like, what, what will it be like in the resurrection? And here you have a coffin and the, the lid's being blown off and you have this exuberance of the human body coming forth. It's the human body in this kind of corporal celebration. And it's a great picture to have in our minds is that this is a Christian view, is that our bodies are very much uh, who we are. Very much, it's not like who you are is your soul. It's who you are is your body and soul. And the bodies are very much a a, a part of who we are. And that is, leads us to our sixth principle that we've been um, building in our theology of gender here. And that's that our bodies express the gender of our hidden souls. Our bodies are signs that point to who we are. And so the bodies are expressing something about ourselves that are very important. And this is something to have firm in our heads as we look at ourselves and our, and our neighbors, our loved ones, and those who are expressing 
conflict about their bodies. We have to understand that the bodies are expressing our souls. They're, they're an important part of what, what we are and who we are. And so if we, when we talk about what gender dysphoria is, and it can be something very intense. It's not something to be to dismiss and say, oh, you know, if you have that problem, let's, if, if a guy has that problem, let's just go out and get a beer, you know, and you'll feel better. Or if a girl has that problem, let's just go shopping for a dress and you'll feel better. No, it can be very intense. But uh, the definition that I would say accurately describes it from a Christian worldview is that it is distress with the way that you are. Because the way that you are is your body. Your body is part of who you are. So if you're feeling distress with your body, it's distress with the way that you are. Okay, That's gender dysphoria. So what I want to do is, is help make this a little less exotic for you this morning. I'm going to help us to understand where that comes from. Where would that body distress come from? Because it's an exaggeration of something that we all share. And I'm going to start with Penelope Cruz. Okay, Penelope Cruz was uh, this beautiful movie star, and there was a magazine article that was commenting on how beautiful she looked in her recent movies. And the interviewer asked her and said, what's your secret? What's your secret for looking so beautiful? Uh, and her reply was very telling. She said, you know, I don't actually have any secrets for looking beautiful. She said, I don't, I don't really think I'm beautiful. I, I know I can look good and I can also look ugly. That was Penelope Cruz. Okay, Scarlett Johansson she was crowned sexiest woman alive by Esquire magazine. And, and then seven years later, she was crowned that again, <laughs> seven years later. And then she was interviewed by Now magazine about her secrets for looking beautiful. She says, what does it feel like to be so, uh, you know, such beauty, have, have this title and be so beautiful? And what her answer was is, you know, I actually don't think of myself as sexy. I tend to see the flaws in my appearance, okay? That's Scarlett Johansson. Keanu Reeves, okay, also dubbed the sexiest actor alive uh, by Glamour magazine. And then it happened again the second year, uh, two years in a row, uh, second year. And then he was uh, talked about, you know, he was interviewed about it, he talked about it. And uh, his response was, I'm not handsome or sexy. Of course, it's not like I'm hopeless. <laughs> you can just hear Keanu Reeves saying that. You know, of course, it's not like I'm hopeless. <laughs> but again, uh, his, uh, his way of looking at himself. So friends, these quotes of movie stars, they're not hard to find. And they're not hard to find because they're clues that what you and I feel, you know, when we're standing in front of a mirror, you know, you and I, ordinary mortals, when we're standing in front of a mirror, what we feel, we're not alone in feeling. Okay. So uncomfortability, uncomfortableness, we could say, or, or kind of this dysphoria, this shame about our bodies, it's, it's universal. Shame about the, of the body is found deep within the human psyche. All of us feel it, more or less. All of us feel it to one degree or another. But for some people, it's exaggerated, and it never leaves their minds. You know? Those of us who get older, older folks, we tend to feel it. When our bodies, you know, we've lost the glow of youth often the dimensions of youth. <laughs> we might especially feel it. People whose, whose bodies have been racked by disease or you know, handicapped by an accident, we might especially feel it. And the gender dys dysphoric especially feel it. And so in the carefully constructed media portraits that you, you'll see, You'll hear many statements about how I feel trapped in, my wrong, in the wrong body. Like how many of you have heard that I feel trapped in the wrong body? You've heard that, right? What you have not, not heard but is trumpeted across 
transgender websites and in gender identity support groups over and over again is this. I can't stand my body. I can't stand my body. So what's underneath that I feel trapped in the wrong body is I hate my body. I am alienated from my body. Now that's a key. Remember the answer to the book uh, giveaway that we just had. What is the last thing in the creation story that we're told about the newly created humanity? The man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. The man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. Now think about what that would be like. The pristine experience of Adam and Eve was of unencumbered nakedness. Imagine, imagine standing in front of a mirror and you're naked and feeling unashamed. Imagine that. If even Scarlet can't do it, even Keanu can't do it. <laughs> if even the movie stars who have, you know, near perfect bodies and unlimited spending accounts, <laughs> if they can't do it, we can't do it. We can't do it by ourselves. But that used to be the normal human experience. It might be hard for us to even comprehend. That was the last thing before the fall. And then if we look, what's the first thing that happens after the great sin recorded in Genesis chapter 3, after that sad fall of humanity? Adam and then Eve and then Adam partake of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. What's the first thing that they experience? And if you go and check, you'll see it is shame about their bodies. They fashion a cover up of fig leaves. They hide among the trees of the garden. God comes looking for them. When he finally finds Adam, he asks him why he was hiding, and he receives the answer, because I was naked. And that's how God knows then that they must have eaten in the story. Right? It's like that reality TV show. What's that reality TV show where they're like naked and out in the woods and something? What do they call that? Naked and afraid. Okay, see, you all know that. I don't, I don't watch unspiritual uh, TV like that. But. No. Naked and afraid, right? I think it's in its like 14th season or something. It keeps going on, that show, ridiculous show. Naked and afraid. Well, this is the Bible's reality TV show. Not naked and afraid, but naked and ashamed. Before the fall, naked and unashamed. After the fall, naked and ashamed. That's our reality. According to the scriptures, that's what's going on with us. So con consider the, the meaning of this. Before, naked and unashamed. Immediately after, naked and very ashamed. What happened? What happened to their appearance? And the answer is nothing. You know, there's nothing that the text tells us, nothing changed about their bodies, but how they looked at their bodies changed. How they looked at them did. You see, what Adam and Eve did was they took on themselves the role of deciding good and evil. They became their own arbiters of morality, and they stepped into the place of defining for themselves the good, the true, and the beautiful, without God. And to decide that for yourselves, right from wrong, good from evil, apart from God's evaluation expressed in his revelation is to put ourselves in the place of God, which we were never meant to be. And it changed their view of everything, including themselves. After they took this step, all they had to do was look down and for the first time and forever after, they saw their bodies apart from God, apart from being in his image, apart from being an icon of God. 
And instead of this independence resulting in a feeling of freedom, the immediate and inescapable result was a profound shame. They saw their physical selves without reference to God, without being an icon of God. And it left them embarrassed and ashamed and unable to sustain the gaze. That's where our gender dysphoria comes from. And it is exacerbated by fashion or by comorbidity or by abuse trauma in our lives. And this is important for us to know as Christians because if we are going to be freed from that shame, if we're going to help others to be freed from that shame, then we first have to understand that it comes from the same step inside of ourselves. See, we are the children of Adam and Eve. And we are similarly have put ourselves in the place of God where we were never meant to be. And so our value and the way we value ourselves no longer comes from being in his image, but just from ourselves. And that's what body shame is. Body shame is looking at yourself apart from God. But the thing is, we can't see ourselves rightly. We can't look at our bodies rightly apart from God. Just you and your mirror do not tell you true. That's why the ways we try to get rid of this shame never work. Okay? Psyching yourself up, dieting, extensive dieting, buying the right clothes, that doesn't really do it. Even the beautiful, um, the movie stars can't do it. We can't be rid of our shame by ourselves. And the current way of transitioning, as it's called, chopping off parts of your body, is another way to be rid of that shame. And it won't work. It won't work. There is no evidence that going through these medical procedures diminishes the chances of suicide. I always want to say that when I speak. I want people to understand. I want parents to understand that. So if he tells you that, you can know it's not true. There is no good evidence that going through cross, you know, in, um, starting on a treatment of cross hormones, cross gender hormones, or going through these surgeries puts person in a, in a better state so that they're less likely to commit suicide. There's no evidence for that. And that's not just my words. That's the words from the current chair of the LGBT task force of the American Psychological Association. Those are his words. Okay. So that's something to know. Why? Because of this truth that, that isn't, this is not going to be the way to address our shame. So instead, let's look at God's answer to our body shame. Because this is how we really can help. Okay. Let's look at God's response to the shame in Genesis 3 in a very surprising move. Okay. What God does is makes a sacrifice for Adam and Eve in order to cloak them with something other than their shame. Right? He takes and he kills one of his precious animals that he created for them. He uses the skin of the animal to clothe them and that's our first lesson. The first lesson is this. You must turn again to God for his provision. You must make him God again in order to be freed from that shame. When you realize that your body is loved, then it can become something beautiful. You know, when somebody important loves your body, then you're on the road to seeing that it's beautiful. You become the gift that you are to yourself and to others. Okay? I love uh, this quote by uh, Corrie ten Boom, who if you, you know her, she was trapped in a Nazi concentration camp in World War II. She saw her body, her sister's body, so many others just degraded and denigrated in this Nazi concentration camp. And afterwards, what she had to say, 
she grimly ob observed, surely there is no more wretched sight than a human body unloved. And you know, when, when you take yourself away from God, you can't see your body as loved. When you turn back to God, you can understand how he values and loves your body. One time I was speaking, uh, was, uh, talking with a man who had this gender dysphoria. And I really liked him. He was a great guy. He was very musical, you know. And one time we were talking, and we got to a particularly honest moment uh, where he was really talking about how he really felt. And I remember we were standing there uh, facing each other, and he was holding out his hands to me. and had these kind of long, graceful hands, you know, uh, wrists and, and fingers, uh, delicate fingers and wrists. And he was holding out his hands for me. We were both looking down at his hands. And he said to me, I'll never forget, he said, I hate these hands. These are girls' hands. I remember I took, I took his hands as, as we were standing there in mine. I looked at him, I said, let me tell you something. These are man's hands. And you should probably take up the piano. <laughs> I was looking at piano players who just kill for these, <laughs> these long fingers like this. And that was a that was a turning point, you know, for him. Is starting to understand his body in a different way. When we turn back to God, we start to understand our body in a different way. Start to see it in the way that He sees it. That's what we need. So when you turn back to God for his view on you, then you, your body and how he looks at your body, whatever's wrong with it, whatever you think is wrong with it, um, you see it differently. And that brings us to the second lesson. Because the first lesson was a promise of a greater provision to come. The clothes for Adam and Eve was a promise of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he was going to bring. Think about what Jesus did for us. What did Jesus sacrifice for us? His body. Jesus Christ's body was sacrificed for us in a way that addresses our shame. Because his body was shamed for you, made utterly naked on the cross, you know, most portrayals of uh, crucifixion, they, uh, for the sake of modesty, they, they're like this one. They have a loincloth across, across him, so for the sake of modesty. But that is not historically accurate, friends. We know the way crucifixion was done, and he was naked. He was completely naked. And not just naked, but disfigured, deformed, he was, made, he was made completely disgusting to look at. Crucifixion uh, was a torture uh, designed to heap the most shame that could be possibly heaped on the human body. It had a 200-year history right around there, 100 years to 100 years before Christ to 100 years after Christ, where it came into history. And Rome used that to visually impress upon any potential rebels just how much shame awaited them for their misdeeds. So you would walk along, you would see a crucifixion, you would say, that will never be me. I will never be in that position. And I will make sure that I never give Rome any excuse, any hint um, to be able to be in this position. But Jesus Christ willingly accepted all of that shame heaped upon him. What was he doing? He was taking our body shame upon himself. Where? In the body of his flesh. And why did he do it? Because we were alienated. We were alienated not only from God, not only from one another, but from our very bodies. We were alienated. He took this on in the body of his flesh. And he did it so that we could be presented above reproach that is without shame. We could be presented and our bodies could be again become something beautiful. So if you're dealing with someone 
especially a teen in this situation. This can bring, this can bring that person back. I was praying recently with a dad who had a, um, a daughter who started going down this trans route. And he helped her back by affirming the truth of what Christ did, what it meant for her body. And you think, wow, what a great, what a great dad he must have been. Like, he must have been super sensitive dad, like be able to talk to a teenage daughter like that and uh, be really sensitive toward her. But he actually wasn't, you know. <laughs> he was kind of this gruff guy, you know, and uh, didn't communicate well. Was, uh, uh, but he was her dad, <laughs> you know, and he loved her. And so you talk to her now. She's married, has several children. She looks back at that time. And she says, you know, I don't know what would have happened to me if my dad had not been in my life at that time. I don't know what would have happened to me. In many, many cases, you can help if you know that God's redemption extends to our bodies as well as to our souls. And that is what will end the inner alienation. All right. Good. So I wanted to give that to you. That's kind of the one of the big pieces of this transgender puzzle. But I also wanted to leave some time for questions because there's a lot of different situations that can come up in this, uh, in, our, in our context. So I wanted to be able to let you take this in the direction that you wanted to go. So let me, um, Nate has a microphone here. Let me ask if there are any questions that you would like to ask at this one. Anyway, looks like we have one right here. So you've given us instructions on how to deal with an individual through love and speaking truth to them. Yes. But how does a Christian react at a societal level when we have states that are, and, and government agencies that are saying this transgenderism, that a six-year-old can go under surgery and, and hormonal blockers, and even at the highest levels of government. What is our role as Christians at a societal level? And I'm giving the analogy of abortion because, you know, Christians protested, we, we, we marched for life, we, we stood up to those agencies, yet at an individual level, to extend love and truth to those individuals that may have experienced an abortion. So can you relate to that? Good, good, that was a great question. Everybody heard that? Yeah, so what's our role as Christians on a societal level? And I would say you're, you're talking really about the, the general question of what kind of role we have and, and should be exercising as citizens. And the answer is we should be active in our political process. We're in a wonderful uh, time. We're, we're very gifted to live in a country where uh, we're, we're living in a democracy where we take part in the government. And political activism is an important part that uh, we should play as Christians. So if you're firm about what you believe and you know the truth, you should use all the levers at your disposal, certainly the vote. You know, you should vote in people who are understanding of, of uh, and really kind of grasp what's going on to be able to combat uh, this legislatively. You should also, yeah, I would think that part, partaking protesting is, is certainly a valid and important uh, uh, activity for Christians to undergo, and, and we, should, we should do this. And the church is where you come to get equipped so that you feel confident in your, in your beliefs that you know and you can act on what's good for people. Uh, in long term, we do need laws that promote life and help life, you know. And I think the, the example of abortion, I would agree, is a great example of how patient work uh, and political activism over time has made a difference. Uh, and that's... Uh, that's a great victory. So I, w I would say this also. Yeah, I think use all the levers at your disposal to, um, to be active in this way. But to do it in a way to make sure, I would just say that, you know, sometimes it can it look like uh, when we're partaking in culture wars that, you know, we're trying to stand up for our rights. And I would say as Christians, very important in the political sphere to make sure that we're fighting for the rights of others. 
and what's good for people. So as long as we keep in our minds, like we're convinced like this is bad for people, this is good for people, we want to promote things that are good for people and that are helpful for people. So as long as we keep that in the forefront, I think political activity is good. Very good question, thank you. Other questions? If you had two minutes to explain to someone um, who has this point of view um, and they were willing to hear you talk for two minutes on the topic, what would you say and how would you go about it? If there's someone in the room here today or just out in, um, in the world, what would you say to them if they were willing to give you two minutes? And so this is just, they have a different view about LGBT stuff? Is that what you're saying? If they actually subscribe to that. Yeah, how would you to that worldview. Yeah, well, I would try to talk about the importance of the body. I would say, I would go into the kind of depth of, of saying, who are we and what are we? And is your body really just something that you can change? Or is it something that's part of you? You know, and express the beauty of the body in the Christian worldview. I would say, you know, as Christian, I understand my body is so important and it's so valuable. It's not something to be treated like uh, uh, something I could just change and that somehow I'm, I'm uh, changing, you know, uh, I can actually become something else that I'm, that I'm not. I would talk about that. That's one, one way to talk about. You know, the more you talk with people, I would listen to them and see what's important to them. And uh, what we do kind of apologetically is we try to find ways that we, things that we share in common. And if you talk with people long enough, you know, you can talk about um, things that, that they might value. You know, the body is important. Um, and also who we are as men and women are important. You know, one, one thing that uh, people don't, seem to realize that transgenderism is on a, a collision course with feminism um, because it's actually working against women and women's opportunities. We can see it in, in women's sports. And so that's something that, that also you can talk about. You say, don't you care about women's rights? Uh, do you realize that allowing uh, men who are really men to start to take over women's sports is, is actually killing opportunities for women? You know, help people to see some of the inconsistency in, in what they believe is another way to help. And there are plenty of in, inconsistencies <laughs> about it. So, yeah, have a good conversation with the friends. Very good question. Thank you. Other question? Yeah. Um, you had mentioned in, in private, we, you and I had talked about the seven years of the cycle the, that, that it takes it, that period of time. I don't want to speak for you, but I just, I thought, I found that very sure. interesting and I would like to see if you could find time to share that. Yeah, I think, I think what you're referring to is um, the fact that uh, the reason, some of the reasons, we could talk about different reasons that are driving kind of the medical industry and what's going on with, with these uh, procedures to imitate the opposite gender. Uh, the reason why uh, they, they persist is that when, when someone is really troubled about their body and they go through like the initial uh, having hormone treatment and they feel differently um, they can feel a kind of euphoria and maybe it masks the trouble that they were having the real problem that they're having for a while but then it goes away but in the initial time, you ask them after it just happened, they might be really happy. It's like, this is great. This is, this is now I can be who I am. But then after time, the, the problem that was there, you know, resurfaces and it doesn't go away. But then, wait, there's another surgery that you can have that'll be even better. And they, there are these different sur surgeries that you can go through to start changing different parts of your body. Um, and so they put their hope on that next surgery. And so I think what, what you're referring to is that it, often it takes something like seven years for a person to get through all these surgeries. And then after that, they realize, wow, I haven't really addressed the problem that was there to begin with. And so it takes a while for the real regret 
um, when they wake up and they realize I've, I've mangled myself here and it, and, and it, hasn't, it, hasn't, it hasn't helped me, uh, it takes a long while for that uh, regret to be realized. And so that perpetuates the cycle. Yeah, thank you. Looks like a hand back there. How do we handle situations where individuals want to go by a different pronoun? I've heard it both ways from a video course in Sunday school a few years ago. A woman who had transitioned was challenged when another Christian said, well, when the Lord calls you home someday and you're standing before him, what name is he going to call you? But then recently I was reading another book where she said, if you don't use the proper pronoun, you're shutting down the conversation. You're not loving that person in the most basic way you can. Yes. Yeah, I know. That's the question, right? Uh, which, how, do, how do we handle the pronouns? And people have different thoughts about it. I think uh, the second view that you said is that we want to be hospitable to people. Uh, and so uh, to use the pronouns they prefer, uh, that, uh, that helps keep open the conversation. You know, I would tell you that um, I was saying this, I think, uh, before. Um, on, on the area of, in the area of names, I'm a little bit more flexible because I feel like names are a cultural convention. Like names mean different things. Um, as I said, it might, be, it might be a little bit harder for parents who've given someone a name and then they, that the child decides they're not going to go by that name. It's a real affront to them. That might be difficult. But for someone that you just know, if you say, I, I want you to call me by this name, um, I think there's a little bit more leeway there. When it, when it comes to pronouns, they really mean something about the person. Like, you're saying something about a person that you say, you're really a, a he when you're a she. And I, I just find that very difficult to do myself. And I, and I usually, what I do is I end up having a conversation with that person. Well, first of all, you know, we've talked about somebody uh, uh, yesterday morning with the youth was sharing how um, you can, there, there's a lot to do in, in, in your workplace where you can avoid using pronouns. You can go through these gram, grammar gymnastics. Uh, and, and I've done that, you know, but I find that when you're just one-on-one -on -one with person, the pronouns don't come up. It's when there's another person in the room or when you're praying uh, for that person, that's when pronouns come up. <laughs> that's when you might uh, uh, run into trouble. But uh, I would say when it comes to pronouns, that I, I really have difficulty saying something untrue about someone I love. And I, I, I phrase it that way. I sit down and say, you know, I love you. I respect the decisions you want to make about your life. And I realize they're your decisions to make. But I, I have a hard time saying something about you that I believe is untrue. And so I, I feel like I can't, uh, I can't say this about you. You know, and I was, I was given the example yesterday with the teens. Um, you know, if your friend believes that she's really fat, you know, do you affirm that? Do you say, oh yeah, you're really fat, you know? No, you know, you so I say, you know, I don't look at you that way, maybe. Or, uh, and that's what, uh, the way I see this. I say, I look at you differently. And to be your friend, um, I, I, can't, I can't bring myself to say something about you that's untrue. Sorry. Yeah, so that's the way I would handle it. Yeah. Did we have yes. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, for young kids um, and thinking too about like Pride Month coming, there's a lot of messages and sometimes it's difficult to know how to... You know, if you just let something go because it went over their head or to speak up and address it. Do you have any wisdom? In, in dealing with your own children? Yeah, young kids before yeah. puberty. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So uh, how do we address it with, with our young children? I would say often and early. Often and early. I think it's very important for us to be able to be interpreting uh, the world for our children and to do it at an age-appropriate way. So, for example, there are a lot of things about this a, a little kid can't understand. But there, there are things that they can understand. You know, it's very important to little children, you know, like I tell a story in that book, it's very important to little children 
uh, what gender they are. They care very much about it and they're exploring that. And they have a lot of different ways of exploring it that are, that are to be expected. And it's not something that should freak us out because gender is moral. It's something that needs to be taught and explained. And so I, I, I'm very much in favor of speaking to our children in ways they can understand. Like, look, here's a boy, and uh, the boy is confused, and he thinks he's a girl, and we want to pray for him because uh, that's not a good thing. God wants him to grow up to be a man, and he's confused about that. And maybe his parents, um, they don't believe as we do, and uh, they don't understand they don't trust what the Bible says about how, he, how God made us. And so they have a different view. And so we want to pray for them because uh, that's not going to be helpful for them. You know? So I would say, yeah, just try to, you know how to talk to your children. You know the words they can understand. And I would say use uh, their words so that they can understand. I, they get it. They can get it. I really think so. But thanks for bringing that up. We do need to talk to our children early about this. Okay, where is Nate? Is he, uh, oh, you're over here.